Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about Atonement Day. Now, you know this channel, Coach in the Fight or Hermes Academy as we like to call it, we're always talking about feast days, when they are, what we're supposed to be doing on those days, and even the biblical significance of those days. And in this class, we're actually going to go in and look at the prophecies around Atonement Day. We're going to look particularly at this chart here by Clarence Larkin. It comes from his book called Dispensational Truth or God's Plan and Purpose for the Ages. Now, I've actually read this entire book. It is one of the only non-scriptural documents that I have in my library. It's sitting right beside the book of Josephus and the time chart of human history. That, I believe, should show how significant this book is. This is Clarence Larkin did a very good job writing this book about a hundred years ago. Not to say that he didn't get anything wrong. Like we learn in the book of Daniel, knowledge will increase in the end times. And those guys a hundred years ago, it wasn't really necessary for them to have a lot of tribulation related knowledge. Unless, of course, they wanted to become idols or such. This information is being revealed to us now because we need it. But anyway, Clarence Larkin, in his book, he actually documented all of his biblical sources, which makes this book extremely significant. Anytime he made a statement, he actually included the verses to back up his statement. So if you think they're in error, you can go back to the source to where he got that information from and look it up for yourself. And that's what we're actually going to do today. We're looking here at his chart called Feast of the Lord. This is the chart where he talks about all of the feast days and compares them to the prophecies. Um, you see, he starts off with the spring feasts, of course, and he gives the relationship between the spring feast and how they were fulfilled back in the Messiah's time. And he goes on and even talks about Pentecost and its relationship to the Holy Spirit. And he talks about this break period that we know has lasted for about 2000 years before he talks about the Feast of Trumpets. Now, we've covered in a class before that the Feast of Trumpets was actually fulfilled with the Revelation 12 sign in the sky back there in 2017, which makes Atonement Day the next unfulfilled feast. And that is the one we're going to be talking about today. What I plan to do, Lord willing, is using Clarence Larkin's information here on Atonement Day and just look and see what he says and even go in and look at these verses that he's referencing and see what the scripture says. So sit back and relax. Be prepared to leave a comment as we go. Go ahead and hit that like button. Make sure you subscribed because this will be a series of classes that we're doing on Atonement Day. I'm actually going to include it in a playlist called The Earth is Going to Shake on Atonement Day. And maybe we'll see why I say that in some of these verses here. So let's go ahead and get started. Starting from the top here. While he's talking about the seventh month, he says that the sixth feast is the day of atonement. And he references Leviticus chapter 23, looks like verse 26 through 32. So let's go over there. And that seems to be about right. Verse 27 is talking about the 10th day of the seventh month. And just as an aside note, um, there are some problems with the Hebrew calendar, um, the Jewish calendar, I should say, if you haven't noticed. Um, check out some of our other videos. We've actually been working to understand the sacred calendar since about 2017. When you're reading a Revelation 12, it talks about changes with our father's people. And one of the changes that occurred in my life, among many, was that all of a sudden I got this overwhelming desire to figure out the calendar. So you can check a playlist that I've created going all the way back to 2017. It's pretty funny as I try to learn this calendar. But it's pretty accurate too as we started off with the scriptures in Enoch as our foundation so even though we made errors those errors were easily understood and fixed over the course of these four years of studying that calendar but anyway it's talking about the 10th day of the seventh month being the day of atonement then it goes on to say it shall be an holy convocation unto you which means that is a, a very important event you know, it is a big deal, this holy convocation. This is the time when a lot of people will invite family members over or make sure that all of their family members are present for this event. Then it says, and ye shall afflict your souls. Now, 
we've done classes on this affliction of the souls thing um let me just say that a fast may require some additional study as to what a true fast is we were always told that it meant abstaining from food and i believe they get that from the book of esther but the other books like isaiah chapter 58 describes a different kind of fast altogether and even goes on to chastise us for participating in that non-food kind of fast saying that it was worthless or something like that so when you're thinking about afflicting your souls jump over there to isaiah chapter 58 and read about that or check one of the videos that we've done then it goes on to say offer an offering made by fire unto the lord now this right here um what i would reference here is the book of malachi in chapter 3 when it says that in the end time the levites will start to make these offerings again and you start to see tell of that now people are starting to make these offerings made by fire but this too i think requires more study as we try to understand exactly what this offering made by fire is supposed to be i'm not sure if we're actually supposed to have the two goats like we read about sending one out there to Azazel and slaughtering the other. But like I said, you do see movement back in that direction while others are looking at the spiritual side of these offering made by fire and they're doing stuff like charitable deeds and prayer and stuff like that. But like I said, this all requires a little more study. But as we can see, we, we skim down through the rest of these verses that uh, Clarence Larkin was right on point as far as this passage is concerned and telling us all about the Day of Atonement. We'll end up doing classes on this in the future, getting into more detail like we did in that first verse up there. But let's go on. Um, we don't want to spend too much time on this. I think everybody knows about those verses. Anybody who's trying to learn to keep the feast days will be very familiar with Leviticus chapter 23. So let's move on down a little bit. Um, even looking at this little pictorial diagram here, you know, been around my channel, you know, I avoid this kind of stuff a lot, you know, because of the second commandment. Um, I'll have to go and, you know, do some praying even about showing you this image here. But I do want to point out this image only because of what we read in the book of Revelation. Mr. Larkin didn't include this reference in that diagram, but I think it very well could. And I may even go in and write it in my hard copy. But it seems as though that picture that he's drawing us over there is actually an illustration of what we read about over in Revelation chapter 8 verses 1 through 5. You see, verse one is talking about how he had opened the seventh seal and we've done classes on the seventh seal coming from the third testament of the Bible. That's one of the benefits of the third testament of the Bible is it helps us to understand these seals and the trumpets and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, people can stop making up stuff, you know, as far as the seals are concerned. We actually have scriptural truth and we have classes on that that you can go in and check out after you watch this video. And what we're seeing here is that the events in verses two through five come after the seventh seal is opened. You see in verse two that after that seventh seal is opened, you got these seven angels that get these seven trumpets. Those are the vile and the trumpet judgments that we read about starting here in chapter eight. But then look at verse three. It says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now to me, and we can talk about it in the comment section, but this seems to be what that picture was describing over there where you had this priest, the high priest with this golden censer before the altar. We say in verse four that the smoke of the incense that he was burning is ascending with the prayers of the saints. And then you see down there in verse five, it says, and the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there was voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. All of that, I believe, is what Clarence is trying to draw out in this picture here occurring on Atonement Day, the biblical fulfillment of Atonement Day. Don't think I'm talking necessarily about 2021 when I say that the earth is going to shake on atonement day. The next thing he talks about is the atonement for Israel. Now, we probably should do a whole class on this. We've, we've touched on it before who Israel truly is. Um, 
here in today's time, we should be recognizing that there are actually two different churches. You know, we want to say the church talking about the big C's church, which would include both of these smaller churches, but the smaller churches included in the big C church are starkly different. One of which is the descendant of the Catholic church. You call them Protestants and Catholics too. These are the people who follow that church doctrine. Um, you can recognize them when they keep the other feasts like Christmas or Easter or that kind of thing. That is one particular church. Um, then you have the other church, which is opposite. They don't do Christmas. They do tabernacles. They don't do Easter. They do Passover. Um, they keep the Sabbath day according to the lunar calendar instead of the Gregorian calendar. You know, they believe that sin is the transgression of the law. And they believe that the law is Exodus chapter 20 through chapter 23, which is the covenant. So to them, sin is breaking one of those rules in the covenant. But the other church, that kind of Protestant church, you know, when you ask them what sin, they're going to have a different definition. But my point is, is that when it's talking about the atonement for Israel, it's talking about this other church, this lesser known church, the spiritual Israel church. But anyway, let's jump over here and let's look at Zechariah 13 and 1. I actually seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties here. But praise the Lord, our Father has prepared me for these days when we're not going to have the internet and such. Um, here at the Hillbilly Homestead, we are off grid. Um, we make all of our own electricity. And anticipating the day when we won't have the internet to look up things, I've actually downloaded the entire Bible in this TXT file for use. Well, let's come over and let's take a look at what Zechariah says using it. Looks a little bit funny here, but I think this is going to work. So it says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. Okay, so this is clearly talking about the Day of Atonement. This is actually a good reference for the Day of Atonement. Talking about this sin and uncleanliness. Verse 2 says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. So now we read all through the scripture that the third testament actually covers this a lot, talking about how these idols are going to fall, even these false prophets. False prophets are actually considered idols um, in the eyes of the Lord. You read about that in Zechariah and other books. Maybe Zechariah chapter 14 talks about how when we go to the prophets instead of going to the scripture um, or going to the spirits, you know, for our knowledge, wisdom and understanding, we go to a prophet instead. Well, that prophet is considered an idol according to the scripture. So what it's telling us here is that on this day of atonement, this prophetic fulfillment of the day of atonement, all of these idols will fall. Like I said, this is part of a series we're doing called The Earth is Going to Shake on Atonement Day. Well, this, I believe, is proof. Anybody who knows this prophecy about these idols falling know that it's all related to this global earthquake when every idol is supposed to fall. And that's what I believe is talking about here. Um, talking about Atonement Day when he says that he will cut off the names of the idols of the land and they shall no more be remembered. This is also related to Babylon falling in the book of Revelation. Um, Babylon was the place where all of these idols were created, believe it or not. That's where Christmas was created. Valentine's Day, Easter, and even some of the other pagan feast days were all created in Babylon. And that's what Revelation is talking about when it talks about the fall of Babylon up there in chapter 17 and 18 and so forth. So that's a good reference, I believe, there. He could have referenced other uh, verses like the one I believe that's related to this image here. He has this image and is talking about Mount Olives and it seems to be showing something coming out of the sky there. Well, let me show you another verse here. 
this is another verse that we'll probably write in on our hardcover copy there but you come over here and you look in Zechariah chapter 14 you see in verse 1 it's talking about the day of the Lord behold the day of the Lord cometh and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee this is atonement day anytime you hear of anybody talking about the day of the Lord it out it's all related to atonement day the earth is going to shake on atonement day this day of the Lord you can read about in the book of Revelation in chapter 6 down in about 13 or 14 or so it talks about the sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light and this earthquake and this meteor shower you read this all through the scripture guys it's what the whole Bible is about is telling us not only telling us about this day but it even gives us detail on what it is that we're supposed to do in order to survive these events Anyway, back over here in Zechariah chapter 14, you see there in verse 2 how it's talking about how he's going to gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Well, this is already kind of going on already. It, it may ramp up a little bit, but it's definitely already started. But what I really want you to see here is verse 4 where it says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. This, I believe, is talking about that rock that we hear about in the book of Daniel that's supposed to come down and destroy the economies and the beast systems of the world. This, I believe, is what it's talking about when it says that his feet shall stand on that day on the Mount of Olives. Then you say, well, the Messiah went up from the Mount of Olives. Of course, he's supposed to return to the Mount of Olives. He went up in a cloud. He's going to come back in a cloud. Well, the thing about it, it appears as though he went up as a man, but he's coming back as a rock because look what it says here it says and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west so this mountain will be split in half this rock like we read about is actually going to take this mountain and turn it into a valley look what it says and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south so this is this image that Claren is showing us over here as he's showing us Mount of Olives and something coming out of this mountain this is why I say that the earth is going to shake on atonement day. But hold up. Verse 5 seems to say this directly. It says, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Now, I've been a search for this Azel. I've been confused about it for a while because you can't find it anywhere else in the scripture. The word Azel, Google Maps, I tried to find this word and I can't find it. So I actually asked it in a video, asked for you guys to help and I got some help. Some of you guys chimed in in the comment section and it appears as though this Azel could be related to Azazel. Azazel is who got the scapegoat on atonement day. You read all about that in Leviticus chapter 16. Lord willing, I'll do a class on this entire chapter as we discuss some of these points. But as far as this discussion is concerned, what's important here is how on Atonement Day they started off with two goats. One goat they slaughtered or sacrificed but the other goat they spit on and cursed and sent them out in the woods and let him go well the one that they let go was actually supposed to go to Azazel I think that what we're being told here is that these goat nations will be sent out to Azazel on atonement day when this rock comes down to shake the earth but then it goes on to say and ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake and the days of Uzziah the king of Judah. So there's only really one biblical earthquake and that's this one here when it's talking about during the time of Uzziah the king and I think it's significant that as it's talking about the day of the Lord and this rock splitting this mountain and it's also talking about this biblical earthquake. The earth is going to shake on atonement day. But anyway, I plan on covering these verses too in this series called The Earth is Going to Shake on Atonement Day. But let's come back over and let's finish up with Clarence Larkin. There's really only one other part here and that's his breakdown where he says historically the fountain of Zechariah 13 and 1 was opened at Calvary but rejected by Israel. After they are regathered, they shall look upon him whom they pierced 
and accept the atonement nationally. Now, we've already looked at Zechariah 13 and 1, but let's come over and let's look at this reference in Zechariah 12 and 10. We got the internet back, so we'll come over and look at it on BibleGateway.com. Verse 9 is really interesting because while we're still talking about the day of the Lord and this great earthquake, you see here that he says that he will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, this, I believe, is referencing spiritual Israel and Jacob's trouble, how these people have been in Jacob's trouble since the abomination of desolation was put in place back there in about 686 with the Dome of the Rock. Well, we learned from the book of Daniel and Ezekiel that that trouble is about to come to an end sometime around January of 2022. And when we see this Day of the Lord event, it won't be Jacob that'll be in trouble. It'll be those who actually gave Jacob this trouble all of these many centuries who will be in trouble. You see right there in verse 10, he says that he will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. This supports what we learn over there in Daniel chapter 12, which again is that chapter that we realize that Jacob's trouble is ongoing and is about to come to an end. It says, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourner for his own son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This, I believe, is pointed to what we read over in Matthew chapter 24 when he says, when they see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, they will mourn or something like that. So what Clarence Larkin has understood is that these events will be the culmination of this regathering. And I kind of agree. Um, like I said, I've read this book and I understand how his line of thinking was when he wrote it. Um, he did make some errors. You can find minor flaws in this statement here, particularly how he's not including the days of all. This is when we're given 10 years leading up to this atonement day. I personally believe when we got that Revelation 12 sign in the sky, which was the prophetic fulfillment of the memorial of blowing of trumpets that also started what we know as the 10 days of awe or 10 years that we are given in order to learn to get back within the graces of the Lord to be regathered, so to speak. And then we have this day of the Lord. I think Clarence Lauren can kind of miss that part out as if all of a sudden these people are going to be united around atonement day. No, the uniting has already taken place. It is those who are not getting united. Those who will continue to be the so-called goats are the ones who will be led out to Azazel. But anyway, um, I just wanted to cover what he had to say. We'll cover a lot more of this stuff um, as we get closer to the Day of Atonement. Um, if you had any other subjects you want to hear about, let us know. We teach all scripture over here at Hermes Academy. We find all of the word of God important and we credit that for our knowledge, wisdom and understanding. We don't think that we're special in any way. It's just that, you know, we believe in these books and we read what they say. And so then, you know, our education is increased in that manner. So with that, I'm going to say go ahead and make sure you subscribe leave a comment if you haven't done so already and hit that like button. Make sure you pray for us and may our father bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.